Is this it? No, it has to load. Load? Yes. This is taking a really long time. You have no patience. When you turn something on, you expect it to... Okay, here we go. Crash Bandicoot. Naughty Dog were put on the map in 1996 after creating a Warner Brothers style cartoon and converting it into 3D in the form of Crash Bandicoot. They were concerned with good graphics and foley to give the game a competitive edge, which it certainly did as it quickly became PlayStation's Mario. By the end of 1999, Naughty Dog made four beloved Crash games alongside Universal Interactive, but then they severed ties and got their eyes on a new IP, Jack and Daxter, another iconic game in the PlayStation library with a focus on creating an immersive world with in a 3D sandbox platformer opposed to Crash's linear platforming. The sequel went big, with its plot being much darker. Naughty Dog were beginning to create games that have more depth than being just fun time wasters that have fragments of a story. This approach evolved even further when they ditched the Jack and Daxter franchise to make Uncharted Drake's Fortune. The game was literally known as Project Big during production, as this would have been one well, of their biggest project yet. And while I don't really like the game, nor do I think it really holds up, you cannot deny the absolute mind milestone this is in the gaming industry. There was an emphasis on storytelling and character done through the impressive advancements in motion capture technology and a huge focus on realism and a large attention to detail. And this is what cemented Naughty Dog as what they're known as today as they continue to produce sequels in the Uncharted franchise that, in my opinion, get better with each entry before creating the sensation that turned out to be a truly landmark game in 2013, The Last of Us. A game that made people respect video games as an art form and was commonly likened to that of a film due to the amazingly well-written characters that push the story forward. The game had a simple plot, but complex characters that you can't help but connect to thanks to the incredibly talented Neil Druckmann who wrote the game as well as co-directing it, which allowed actors Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson to transform into Joel and Ellie as you followed them across America with the goal of putting an end to the zombie apocalypse. This divides the gaming landscape into pre-Last of Us and post-Last of Us us eras due to how influential it is. You could play a game and not know when it came out, but tell that it came out after Last of Us because it changed the scene forever to allow for more mature games. Druckmann did such a good job in this game that he got pushed to the forefront of the company and chosen to head Uncharted 4 A Thief's End before making their magnum opus, the controversial sequel, The Last of Us Part 2. A game that takes risks in its narrative and does something that hadn't been done before which is so surprising to come across in 2020. This game game is truly art of the highest caliber and the biggest proof that lends credence to the idea that video games are the best medium for storytelling by blending gameplay with the story to create unparalleled responses from players. to talk about the Uncharted series, but honestly, I feel you'd be perfectly fine if you haven't played the games before. You don't need to in order to understand this video, nor will it directly spoil any of the good bits for you, but if you haven't played them and you want to know nothing, uh, go away quick because they're coming, they're coming for you, oh my- In this game, you play as Nathan Drake, your typical wisecracking everyman as we follow him and a few of his friends race to find the Chintamani Stone and the Lost City of Shambhala before war criminal Zoran Lazarevic and his mercenaries do. And there are several parts in the game where those mercenaries cause a lot of problems for you and therefore Nathan, having to kill them in order to progress. And it's seemingly having no effect on Nathan as he continues to crack jokes. <laughs> hey, check it out. Marco. Really? Come on. No. Marco. <sighs> Hello. It isn't until a final boss fight where the weight of the situation is pitched onto him. You think I am a monster? But you're no different from me, Drake. How many men have you killed? How many just today? That's it, boy. No compassion. No mercy. 
While I was playing the game, I was having a lot of fun and thought it was pretty great, but this is what made me understand why so many people have held it as the best video game of all time. And that's because this scene could only be done in a video game. Yes, you could do it in a film and it would still expose how awful the everyman archetype is because for some reason we're supposed to root for this guy who kills hundreds of people all while expressing no remorse? But it being done in a video game is so much more impactful because it's not just Nate who did all of that cold-blooded murdering, it was you. All of that weight is now put onto your shoulders as well. It's crazy how they make you feel guilty for doing what you're supposed to do. But what if I told you it was actually up to your choice the whole time and you really did cause a whole bunch of kids to grow up without a parent for basically no reason. There's a stealth level where you can get past it without killing anyone. Realizing that made me feel even worse about myself and I'm sure many others because I just run and gun through that section simply because I find it fun. So that's a fantastic ending and a really good way of making people think before acting. But it's not perfect. And this is where I whip out my beret and start using my big boy words such as ludonarrative dissonance. People who play games are aware that cutscenes and gameplay are almost two different universes. The cutscenes are the canonical events while gameplay are the weird fan fictions. And that's something we've just kind of accepted. For example, one of my favourite games, Borderlands 2, a looter shooter where enemies are essentially bullet sponges, has a cutscene where a character dies from a single bullet. And while part of you is shocked and saddened by this death, part of you is also laughing because just before this you unloaded about 17 magazines of three different guns into one enemy. So you find it weird that this dude died with only a single blast so you can't fully invest yourself into the story because it doesn't match what you've been playing. And that is pretty much what I mean by ludonarrative dissonance. So while the ending is cool and Nate clearly feels ashamed of himself, you and Nate are right back to killing hundreds of people in the next two games, almost as if that cutscene never happened and undoing Nate's character development. Is this an unfair criticism as they obviously weren't going to drastically change the gameplay for its successes and I only included this to show off the fact that I know what ludonarrative dissonance this means? Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I think this still stands, although it's hard to place where the blame lands. Should it go on to 2 or 3 and 4? Because before Druckmann became the biggest name in gaming and took on Uncharted 4, Uncharted 4 was originally going to have Nathan not pick up a gun until the halfway point, clearly trying to progress this pacifist arc, which I really like because it would have been true to the character, but also at the same time, would that have been fun? Anyway, talking about 3 and 4... You yet again play as Nathan Drake as he races to search for the lost city of Ubar before Catherine Marlowe and her mercenaries do. That sounds so familiar. Yeah, all these games practically have the same plot, but they're still superb, and free is especially. I feel this game is very overlooked and not given enough love. I feel it deserves more attention for how well it makes you care for the characters, specifically Victor Sullivan. This is the first time we have flashbacks in the series which show how he and Nate met. It's very heartwarming and adds a lot of depth to these characters that were borderline outlines of who they are. So fast forward to the end of the game and there's a dream sequence that mirrors the flashback at the beginning where Sully saved Nate's life, and ultimately yours, only in this dream sequence, the man pointing a gun back at you is Sully, and this stunned me. The game had done such a good job of fleshing these characters out that I could not shoot Sully. I was conflicted because the game is giving me this choice and I don't know if there's a right way or not. I didn't want to shoot him but what if the game needs me to in order to progress? And I was relieved when it carried on to the next bit before I could make up my mind. And I'm sure there are many players who, like myself with the stealth level in Among Thieves, felt really bad about themselves after finding out you didn't need to shoot him. Linking back to Among Thieves which persuaded you to think before acting. So although it's very similar to Among Thieves in that sense, this really stands out to me and is what makes Drake's Deception so special in my eyes. Mashing the gameplay, plot and character all into one for an experience you cannot get elsewhere. Okay, so this isn't super special as it's done in other forms of media all the time, but I just want to include it because I love this game and once again, it being interactive makes it hit home more. At the beginning of the game, we see Nate in his attic looking through all his old artifacts. For new players, this just gives them some backstory so they can understand how good he is at this, but for returning players, it's the fan service room with all his previous adventures that you went on with him. I don't need to explain this, it's just nice. Right, I'm about to talk about The Last of Us, and honestly, most spoiler warnings YouTubers give out are to cover their tracks, but if you watch the next section without having played The Last of Us Part 2, I will actively dislike you. <laughs>
You genuinely are stripping yourself of a one-of-a-kind experience that I believe is not only the best video game ever made, but the best narrative ever told through anything. So please be warned, I am spoiling fucking everything about these two games. <laughs> The Last of Us Part 2 is a very meaningful game to me, so I will do my best to do it justice while also keeping it short because I could ramble on endlessly about this game. The characters in this series are so insanely strong and really are the high point of them. Their arcs are so well concluded and polished, and the arcs of two particular characters are what make this narrative only work through the video game medium, because you don't just see them change, you cause them to change, and change along with them. Those characters being Ellie and Abby. But first let's talk about Joel as his arc also has a very fitting and heart-wrenching ending. We all played as Joel in the first game and grew to love him as being with Ellie humanized him. At the start of part two, we see him happy with life. Living in Jackson has given him a sense of community and normalcy again after being a near heartless, hardened criminal. And it's such a pleasant sight. So when Abby kills him after playing as him for about 15 hours and bonding with him, it hurts even more because it's like a part of you has been killed. And even worse, because you you are responsible for it. You've been playing as Abby, making her get her way to Joel so she can kill him. Joel's blood is partly on your hands. But this is where the good shit comes in. Ellie becomes blinded by her rage and grief. As do you. We loathe Abby after what she did to Joel and crave to see her comeuppance. So you and Dina set off to get revenge on Abby. And in doing this over the course of three days, Ellie loses herself. She's thinking irrationally, she's not listening to others, she is torturing and murdering innocent people in her hopes this will give her some sort of satisfaction, but it doesn't. And those innocent people were Abby's friends. So she comes after you in this vicious, never-ending cycle of revenge. And then... The game now forces you to play as Abby again as you see the past three days from her perspective. And no one wanted to do this, but as you do, we learn that Abby is no different to Ellie at all. Joel killed her dad, so she sets on a journey to kill Joel. Abby killed Ellie's surrogate dad, so she sets on a journey to kill Abby. So why should I despise Abby, but still love Ellie? Understanding her story makes you empathize with her and forgive her. As you play as her, she reverts back to her human side, saving Lev and Yara from the Seraphites. And her relationship relationship with Lev mirrors Joel and Ellie's relationship from the first game as Lev humanizes her just like Ellie did to Joel. So how can you possibly dislike a character when they are 50% one of your favorite characters and 50% another one of your favorite characters? So although the two are the exact same person, their arcs have flipped. Abby becomes what Ellie was in the beginning and Ellie becomes what Abby was in the beginning. You have become the very thing you hate. So how can you kill the very thing you love? And obviously, everything I've said so far regarding these two remarkable characters could easily be done in a film. It's basic character writing for a character to do something and their motive be revealed to make you forgive them, get angrier at them, or just have a neutral stance on it. And it being a video game enhances that because you are experiencing it firsthand and causing everything to happen. You aren't just seeing the characters, you are them. So the emotional connection will surely be far stronger, but this isn't anything too major in terms of using the medium to its advantage, but it does lead into something that does. Fuck, fuck, I kicked, oh shit, I kicked the mic stand. After 10 hours of being Ellie and 10 hours of being Abby, we get an intensely afflictive scene you have to play through. Still playing as Abby, you have to fight Ellie. And you don't want to kill Ellie. She's a character you cherish with all your heart. So simple solution, don't do anything. But then that means Abby will die and you don't want her to die either because she's also a character you now love. And also you can't progress if you don't fight Ellie. Naughty Dog force you to do something you do not want to do in the slightest and it is one of the most intelligent choices in storytelling ever. I did not think I could hate myself any more than I already do, but writers Neil Druckmann and Hallie Gross made me. The scuffle ends with Abby showing mercy to Ellie and not killing Dina, her pregnant girlfriend. While earlier, Ellie killed Mel, Abby's pregnant friend, which really seals the deal for how Ellie is far worse than Abby at this point. 
We then get a very beautiful sequence conveying Ellie now has everything she wanted, but she is still not at peace. She still feels the need to make Abby pay as she places the blame of her mental trauma onto her, so she thinks killing her will resolve that trauma. Therefore, she sets off to find her yet again, leaving everything she has left behind. And the game ends with us playing through something that, had it been at the beginning of the game, we would have done it no problem, but now it is so difficult. We get a reversed version of the fight we just had that answers the question I asked earlier. And for me, the answer is, I can't. Now playing as Ellie, you need to fight Abby. Once again, incredibly distressing scene and the most conflicted I have ever felt. The stakes are ridiculously high. I don't want Abby to die, but I don't want Ellie to die either. But I also don't want to see Ellie lose everything that made her Ellie by killing Abby, as she would also consequently lose Dina as well. And for the people who had bewilderingly not forgiven Abby at this point, I like to think that even they have enough of a soul to find this fight challenging because Abby is almost defenseless. She's clearly been through hell and back. She has literally been crucified. She's definitely gotten her karma for killing Joel by now. So hopefully they were able to step into her shoes for a moment and realize how sickening it is that Ellie freed her only to kill her. Thankfully she doesn't go through with it because as she's drowning Abby we cut to a shot of Joel playing guitar from Ellie's POV. Making her realize that killing Abby won't do any good, and so she stops. She realizes killing Abby will just continue the cycle of revenge. She realizes it won't give Joel justice. She realizes what she's become. And most importantly, she fully forgives Joel in this moment as she realizes the primary reason she was bloodthirsty to make Abby pay was because she had not forgiven him and now will never get a chance to restore their relationship. Although Abby didn't drown, in my own tears, I did at the next scene. We play guitar one more time and it breaks our heart because we can't. Ellie thought that killing Abby would bring her closer to Joel, but it moved her further away because now she can't even play the song he taught her. Her quest for revenge truly made her lose everything and it could not have been shown better than it is in this game. we go, another video where I bring the pacing to a screeching halt to gush about The Last of Us Part 2. But this time there was actual substance to it as I referred to certain parts of it along with Uncharted 2, 3, and 4 and explained why it proves video games are the best medium for storytelling. And that's hard to outright say because art is subjective and made to be consumed in different ways for different reasons. Someone might think films are the best medium for storytelling because they are audio visual and you don't really have to do anything to consume it. Same with TV but add the fact that it's easier to digest and allows for a bigger connection with the characters. Someone might think literature and podcasts are the best medium for storytelling because the visuals are up to your imagination. Personally, music is my favourite medium for storytelling purely because it is the most accessible. So we can argue what truly is the best medium for storytelling, but you cannot argue that video games have the biggest potential and Naughty Dog's passion and ambition and crunch time use that potential to the fullest in their games, which is why they are treated as such prestige in the gaming landscape and why I believe, although not my favourite, video games are the best medium for storytelling. As well as including queer characters that are main characters. I think, yeah, I don't think I'll include that. I think I'll just put in a blooper, uh, like that thing where I'm like, therefore she sets off to find her yet again, leaving everything she has left behind. Oh my god, just like the DLC in the first game. Holy shit. <laughs>